And welcome back to this session on tomorrow's digital beauty trends and emerging tech. And I'm very pleased to welcome for this session two talented futurists. We have Lucy Green, a forecaster, strategist, and award-winning author specializing in cultural trends, consumer insight, and brand innovation. She is founder of Futures Practice Light Years, where she works with global lifestyle brands on strategy, research, and innovation. In 2018, Lucy released her debut book, Silicon States, The Power and Politics of Big Tech and What It Means for Our Future. And joining Lucy is Victoria Buchanan, F Futures Director of London-based futures consultancy, The Future Laboratory, and she specializes in future thinking and consumer research. Thank you, Lucy and Victoria, for taking part in this session. Uh, with us at Beauty Tech Live, and we're going to have a look to see how beauty and tech will evolve in the future, especially in terms of uh, the, 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 the digital and e-commerce and content side of things. So we'll have two main um, focuses, I would say. Uh, first, uh, talk about maybe uh, content, uh, which is so key today, and we've heard a lot of that over this week. And then maybe look uh, at e-commerce, uh, after that, we can maybe um, have just a general discussion about any trends that we um, haven't touched on and take some questions from the audience. So in terms of uh, content, what do you think beauty brands should be focusing on to stand out online? Because there is so much content out there. Um, should they be focusing more on partnerships with content creators and harnessing the organic user generated content? or should they be using more of their own content? Um, do you think they're experimenting enough? Maybe Lucy, if you wanna start with that. Yeah, I mean, I think the pandemic has really accelerated this sort of, well, one arms race to kind of bridge the divide between what's a physical store and at home and content has become a key part of that. Um, and it's really blurred also with this idea of community. So um, you're seeing video, you're seeing discussion, you're seeing live um, interactive chats become part of a brand's using that to like basically create a community around what they're creating. So I think it's a, it's a mixture and also just generally brands starting to think of themselves as media companies and be much bolder in, time, in terms of the kinds of content that they would produce, whether that is, I mean, pretty much anything could be content now. It could be a podcast, it could be an experience, it could be a video game. So we're seeing, the, I, I guess the most interesting brands being much more creative in how they approach, how they approach that. Okay, Victoria, what, what do you think? And maybe if you could touch also upon if brands are letting go enough uh, in terms of, of content. Uh, we heard the other day a TikTok panel and, um, you know, that you have to just throw anything at it and see what works and yeah. lose control a little bit. Um, how, how do you see that? Yeah, I think, I mean, building on what Lucy just said, I think the big shift that we've seen is that kind of shift from kind of influencer culture to this kind of like content creator culture. Um, and I think like, I kind of look at what's happening, you know, in the music industry um, and I kind of start to think of like beauty consumers now as fans. And so this relationship that these kind of new content creators are building with their fans is just kind of, yeah, way more intimate, way more um, connected. And I think, we're kind of really starting to see now how, um, you know, it used to be like, if you're a brand, you go to an ad agency and you'll try and come up with some kind of marketing campaign. Whereas now you've got these content creators on these platforms like TikTok, who are, as you say, just kind of like testing, they're being really creative, you know, the, their videos are going viral. Um, and I think like it's really changing how we think about content and, um, it's no longer something that's just really kind of like polished and seamless and I think in many ways like a big shift away from like platforms like Instagram where we've seen this kind of you know digital perfection and the filters to a much more kind of like open sourced relationship now um, where it's about like you know creating the filters and giving your community those filters to play with and experiment with too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of generational, isn't it? I mean, I think yeah. you and I have spoken about this before, like if millennials represent the, the, I guess, the Instagram aesthetic, like the way Gen Z's, I'm sorry, I've been in New York too long, Gen Z's use um, social media generally, the emphasis is less on perfection and, and beauty and traditional ideas of beauty, like the sort of the, um, the male gaze. 
um, much more towards something that is like about, about creativity, about creating something unexpected. In, when you look at the entire way that they use social media, whether it is on a TikTok or, 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 or whatever, it's always about creating something new and like worth sharing and, and like, yeah, going against traditional ideals. Yeah. So it's just, for me, it's a generational thing and who are the, the cultural drivers right now? And it has shifted towards Gen Z. Yeah, and I think like that sense of collect collectivity that's like, you know, I think like Rihanna has just launched a TikTok house where she is tapping into this trend for like these TikTok hype houses where you have all these creators like living in these mansions in LA, like solely for the purpose of like creating content. And I think the new wave of beauty brands that are like understanding they need to be part a part of those communities and they need to um, like really, I guess, be connected to those communities because then you have um, content creators like, you know, Addison Ray, who's like, she's got 73 million followers on TikTok and she's now launching her own beauty brand. Um, so I think like the big beauty brands are starting to kind of think, you know, how can we actually play authentically like in these community spaces? It's difficult though for those, I mean, obviously the indie brands, they have less at risk, I would imagine. And obviously those new wave of brands that you just mentioned there, and um, it's much easier for them. Um, can you see them really embracing that? Um, I mean, is it a risk for them or is it a risk not to go there? I mean, I think we're seeing just a whole shift in like the role of brands generally where the brand landscape is becoming really fragmented and de decentralized so we talked about creators but also you're seeing the rise of sort of curator type brands where it's about one individual but moving into several different spaces I mean people like Virgil Abloh who's like both a DJ a creative director doing a partnership and you'll sort of get you get behind him and his lens on the world and you move it with him into fragrance into entertainment and so on and I would say Rihanna is a good example of that um, Victoria and I, you and I have talked about Yeezy as well and um, so it's about kind of the individual but then you, to your point you have all these you have it, it's never been easier to launch your own brand and create um, merch at the very basic level um, but creative content so I actually think that the bigger brands, it says something actually about the role of bigger brands in our culture generally now, that they're probably, I hate to say it, but less important. And unless you are like a Nike, I don't know, if Victoria, if you'd agree. Yeah, and I think it's like the, the brands just like, you know, need to almost think of themselves less as kind of like, I think in the past brands have tried to almost, you know, it's been top down. And I think the big shift now is that brands are realizing, you know, they almost need to be like the springboard for creativity for these content creators. They need to kind of like give over the reins. Um, and I think, you know, they're looking more to partnerships now. And I guess what Lucy touches on there is really interesting that like, actually it's quite an exciting time for brands in some ways because if you're a beauty brand now, there are all these other cultural spaces that you can be playing in and you can, you know, I almost think like when Justin Bieber, for example, does a song with like, you know, a Korean pop artist, all of a sudden he creates this whole new fan base in another place. And I think that's what's quite exciting about all of these kind of cultural spaces that brands can now actually start to speak to like the gaming community, the hip hop community, the streetwear community. Um, and it actually kind of opens up like a whole new audience for them. Okay, that brings me to my next question, actually, about uh, gaming. Um, there has been a lot of talk about that. And some brands have launched some initiatives in there. They're testing the waters a little bit. How do you see gaming for beauty? Um, and what would be the best approach for a beauty brand looking to get into that gaming arena? Um, shall I? I Go ahead, I, please, I, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, I think gaming is hugely influential and it's not just on the from the point of view of like the fact that um, it's becoming a major cultural influence and people like taking part in gaming en masse and discussion around gaming en masse content discussing gaming has become a, a content vertical in its own right um, but the fact that it's influencing the aesthetics of beauty particularly among Gen Z's I would say um, the way that we 
expect to navigate e-commerce. Like, so you have really exciting companies like Obsess AR in New York, which has created these amazing game-like non-linear um, websites, but with the insight that why are all, why are all e-commerce websites designed like wireframes with identical layouts? So, so having a lot of influence in a number of ways, I think thus far, like fashion and beauty are quite guilty of approaching it in quite a sort of novel or superficial way, almost like a media buy or a PR stunt. And they haven't really thought about like what the long tail of this is. And to me, the most exciting part that is sort of already gathering or has arrived is the idea of virtual products and uh, whether that's filters or virtual makeup. And um, so you have really exciting creators like Innes Alpha, who's worked with Your Beauty, um, not just creating digital makeup, but actually rethinking the medium entirely with this sort of augmented reality gamified um uh sort of approach so she's she's asked the question like if it is animated beauty product like does it need to be static does it need to actually look like lipstick you can have it moving and, and so i think you can see more and more of this idea of like virtual creative directors for beauty brands or even virtual beauty brands on their own inspired by this now that we've completely recognized that a virtual product can have its own value and also transcend the medium in some ways would you agree with that, Victoria? Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, when you look at Gen Z as a generation, you know, there's like some things going on with that generation that just means that this kind of like digital acceptance, you know, they're worried about sustainability. They're just less bothered by like physical, um, tangible ownership. They're spending so much time in these digital platforms like I think you know the time spent consuming content now is something like on average seven hours a day um yeah like these gaming platforms the kind of speed at which they are um accelerating and I think especially because you know during the pandemic there was that kind of shift again like more people spending time in these platforms like I think it just starts to create a really interesting um, you know, like we talk about it as the kind of like metaverse, like the next kind of like um, wave of the internet where like experiences just start to become way more immersive, way more like we often use the word like programmable, personalized, um, because I think what's interesting is, you know, when you think about gaming, you're having there's like that notion that you're having this kind of like self-steered experience and discovery. So there's that sense of personalization, but then there's also that community in those platforms yeah. that people are really craving. So I think, yeah, it kind of like accelerates to really big like human needs too. Yeah, I think the, the community thing is a really interesting word, like certainly on work that I've done with, sorry, but I'm still Gen Z. I, I've just got too used to calling them Gen Z teenagers. Um, the community thing is really interesting. And I think it's why it's almost replaced with the exception of TikTok, gaming, gaming communities have become where they socialize uh, because it feels more inclusive and you can be who you want. And there's this sense of sort of mm. own ownership. Like, and there's, I think the other thing about gaming is it allows a fluidity of like identity as well, like how you express yourself. Like it's almost like meta gender, you know, like because you can be an alien, you can be anything you want. Um, so there's a number of things which make me think it's only gonna continue. And, and as Victoria mentioned, like during the pandemic that has become even more, I think like the idea that they're venues for experiences is has also, you know, you see um, Fortnite, for example, that had a, a concert in stage within it uh, with Travis Scott. They're now thinking of themselves as like the next Madison Square Gardens, like where you will buy tickets to a virtual concert. So I, I just think this is only going to go like further and further. And the other thing about the pandemic is that I think you have the parents of Gen Z's starting to embrace it. So they're sort of influencing upwards the in the in the age um vertical it's interesting what you're saying there because one of my questions was um or is gaming going to be the new social network is it going to be the new malls are we going to see commerce in gaming uh there can you see that can you see um for example some of those uh, gaming platforms supplanting so a lot of the social media platforms that we see and also being you know there for e-commerce will, will that will that materialize yeah, I think like we've all, I'm not sure if everyone saw this, but um, 
complex the sneaker um festival this year obviously had to shut down because of um covid like they couldn't have a big event where everyone comes together to like meet their favorite um sneaker brands and um like connect with their peers so instead they created like a fully virtual um hub that essentially became like yeah this metaverse experience um, that you could almost navigate like a shopping mall um, and it had like diff it, I guess they describe it as a festival um, and it had yeah commerce in there so you're in there socializing you're in there listening to panel talks um, and then they also have ways for you to be able to kind of shop when you're in those spaces so yeah I mean I think you know it's still relatively kind of new for a lot of people but I think um, you can definitely start to see that like as more brands invest in that space that it will become just like more intuitive and exciting but I think what's really important about those experience it's like how do you actually create the experience right in those spaces like the Travis Scott example I think is a really good one because like so much went into creating this really like immersive exciting experience like it wasn't just a concert on zoom um, so I think, yeah, there's something really interesting about how you have to sort of like craft that experience in these platforms. Yeah, I totally agree. Like thinking about it um, holistically, like you sort of saw that with um, the Balenciaga show as well, that was sort of set as a video game. The most successful examples, I and, and I, I think that really, this I saw this a lot in the luxury space last year, like a lot of luxury brands and fashion brands were sort of caught with their pants down as in they have always relied on like quite a sort of interchangeable online store and relied on the flagship as like where you go to hang out, right? And then suddenly they had to find a way, like in the absence of events and in the absence of the physical store, had to find a way to like engage people. and. I think the impetus was at first just to make it online or create stores or, or create online stores that really just replicate the physical environment of their flagship. And actually the most exciting stuff is gonna go way, way beyond that. And I think gaming will be a key part of that. The, the other in interesting piece of this, I think as well, is this idea of augmented reality becoming more and more baked into everyday consumer behaviors. Like, so if um, the latest sort of shift in consumer behavior was sound that like very much accelerated, like voice operation went from like latent to everyone immediately, like to the point where you've got toddlers asking Alexa. I think the next thing now that the tech giants are literally layering in at scale, augmented realities will see much more collapsing of not only the physical and the digital, that's such a cliche, but like, this idea of that kind of gaming the streetscape or gamifying the streetscape by layering on it, like some mixed reality on a mobile mixed reality, in other words. It's interesting. I mean, can you see that augmented reality? You know, we've, we've heard examples about, you know, having the avatar in your home with you to show you latest products, for example. You know, you're talking perhaps to a beauty advisor and then you have her at home with you, uh, you know, telling you about the product. Can you see that? It's all very experimental at the moment, but can you see that? kind of uh, becoming a possibility uh, further down the line? Oh, for sure. And um, also just like the fact that it'd be super contextual and know your online behaviors. It's like, a, it's like bringing all your online data into the physical environment almost. And being able to like even go into Sephora and it will just say where the lipsticks are or whatever, like for quite functional, but I, there's also scope to sort of layer these sort of interactive experiences. I mean, we've already seen brands doing a little bit. I think the distinction for me is there's two things. One, that it is gonna become more of a default behavior. Whereas before I think it was something consumers, it's something that you experiment with as a novelty. I think it's gonna become more regular, but also seeing a lot of um, the most interesting tech creatives or let's say digital like multidisciplinary tech creatives really playing with this idea of networked experiences. Um, so like how would an augmented reality thing interact with an environment and then have also sound layered in and um, manufactured and how would personalization layer into that and how could you create these amazing um, sort of offline but digitized experiences is really interesting. Like there's a, a artist called Jakob Steenson who's been doing some work with Google um, creating this, yeah, what he would call networked experiences of augmented reality plus sound plus mobile plus everything. So it's combining all of those 
digital tools together basically to have this yeah uh, yeah okay yeah, um, and it Victoria, makes me think yeah. About, yeah it makes me what well, makes me really think about like um you know the rise of things like the peloton bikes the lululemon mirror like I think before the pandemic, there definitely would have been, you know, if you went to CES, you would have seen all of these smart mirrors and there were like all these kind of concepts for things in the home that would bring all of that technology that Lucy's describing into the home. And I think before the pandemic, there was almost a kind of like, we don't want that technology really like in our bathrooms, in our living rooms. But I think actually the pandemic has like accelerated that acceptance. Yeah. Um, that people all of a sudden have been like, well, I can't go to the yoga studio. I can't get to um, like see my um, makeup artist, my skincare person. So like, I now want to be able to like bring all of those things into, into the home. Um, and I think like those devices start to show us like the new ways that these brands will be able to really kind of like own more of a stake in our routines in the future too. Mm -hmm. okay yeah 100 percent. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit also about uh about social networks um obviously tiktok exploded last year um during during the pandemic and um, what does that mean for the older social networks um, i mean there's this kind of constant renewal it would seem um and that makes things very difficult for beauty brands just knowing where to place their bets as it were i mean also with tiktok there was so much uncertainty last year uh, about what was going to happen in certain markets in the us especially um how do you see that um how should brands be playing or is it a matter of um testing everything i mean uh, how do you see the sort of that renewal of social networks there yeah i can go first on that one yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting because we've obviously reached saturation point with so many of the social networks now that for most brands, the kind of like cost of acquisition of a new consumer on a platform like Instagram um, or Facebook probably like is not even really worth the investment for a lot of brands anymore because they're just not getting that kind of like organic um, reach. But I think like the overall shift that we're seeing is that social platforms, like I think Instagram ultimately is trying to become like a shopping mall, like everything that they're doing is pushing that platform towards like a commerce platform and um, where it all becomes kind of like integrated. Um, like I saw something the other day that was around like the live stream feature, being able to allow you to like instantly sell through the live stream and then link up your invoices and send inventory. Um, but I think like ultimately the kind of like next wave of social media is there for like that blurring of lines between e-commerce, entertainment and that kind of like socialization that Lucy talked about um, at the beginning. And so, you know, I think those platforms are still valid for brands, but I think brands are just really now realizing that like, you know, if you're Glossier and you've built your whole brand on like the Instagram platform actually like that's not sustainable forever and there are these new spaces now that brands are starting to experiment in and I think it's those brands that like get onto these new platforms first where they can actually kind of like have that authenticity where they can test and trial um, you know I think like Burberry for example is a really good brand that will just kind of get stuck into these new platforms and see how um, the consumer reacts. So I think just having that much more kind of like experimental um, approach to these platforms is is really key. You, you mentioned their commerce, commerce, but it seems like they're all getting into commerce. I mean, it's not it's not just Instagram. There's a lot of talk about TikTok with commerce as well. We we talked a little bit about gaming, and it could be a potential commerce avenue as well. Is that going to put consumers off I mean because if you're talking about a community and I'm here to be a community and talk about skincare or makeup the subject that I want and interact with other people in that community do I really want people trying to sell me or brands in there trying to sell me products how, how do you see that because it's a, it's a fine kind of line uh, between the two and it, it must be it's quite difficult to, to try and balance that when you're not exactly in a in a shopping mind mindset uh, to have products pushed on you as it were what do you think Lucy 
I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like Instagram is just adapting to what people, what the pain point and the friction was. Like I personally, and I know I'm not alone, literally screen grab or have until recently. I, I Instagram is an engine of consumption. It's basically what Condé Nast kind of should have been. And, and so to me, it's literally just made what your impulse or what, you're, what you would want much more seamless and, and easy. And the only thing I'd say about the sort of social media platforms and yeah, TikTok of course is this idea of how, well, Victoria mentioned this a little bit as well, like the amount of content we're consuming now. I think what's been really interesting during the pandemic is the amount of long form content that we now consume via social channels and, and the move, I mean, it sounds obvious, but not just a video and live video, but long form interactive video. So, you know, it's not just that, that TikTok is like small, short clips, it's that you will literally consume it for hours and hours and it's replaced almost TV, right? And the same with Instagram, we've seen a massive uptick in people spending and it's more and more time, like, you know, hours that they'll participate in a long form Q&A. I think, or, or just all watch a long form video and you've seen people actually create, you know, Miley Cyrus created her own TV show from scratch for, for her fan base and sort of helping them with mental health during the pandemic last, last year during lockdown. So I think this idea of like, I don't know how I would, maybe, maybe like entertainment is sort of inherently moving more towards social media first sort of interactions. Like um, you've already seen Samsung, for example, uh, create a TV that has the ability to go portrait and also interacts, that uh, shows all the sort of social interactions and responses. So I think you're seeing, I guess, a, a convergence between social media and long form entertainment. So if I was a brand, not only thinking about commerce, I'd be thinking about how to create like compelling entertainment on those channels, because to me, the TV and social media are completely combining now. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess I think the other thing that I would kind of like build onto that is like, people are now starting to talk about these new social platforms that are more like digital campfires that are like much smaller, much more intimate, like these platforms that aren't, you know, like Facebook is run on an ad model, which means that you're on those platforms going to get a certain amount of advertising. So I would say like in the, I don't necessarily think like at the moment this is happening in the beauty space, um, but like more broadly, one of the big shifts that we're seeing is like this push away from these big open platforms towards these much more kind of like intimate platforms where, um, you know, like there's actually like a massive shift now where people are actually like willing to pay for good content too. Yeah. So you see it in things like Substack, like the rise of all these new kind of like niche newsletters that people are saying. Email. For yeah airmail um like only fans where people are actually quite willing to sort of like create this quite tight-knit community um and like pay to be a part of that community so i think that's like quite an interesting shift to you to think about for the future of beauty okay yeah i think also the subscription idea of twitter doing um subscriptions as well and of some of those other those other yeah. platforms it's yeah people willing to pay i suppose uh for for that um, just another uh, new uh, platform that emerged recently and that created a huge buzz is Clubhouse, obviously, as well. Um, how do you see that? Is that um, because there's a lot of question marks over that? It's very new. Um, we have seen some beauty brands venture in there with some initiatives, you know, holding some talks on there and whatever. Um, is that going to to last? I mean, there's a there's some doubts and some skeptics over that. And, and what, what would be the best way that a beauty brand could approach Clubhouse? Or should they wait? I mean, it, I think it's sort of uh, in the last in the last year or so, it's been it's become popular among certain audiences, and I think it sort of taps into that edutainment divide. Like, sorry, the trend forecaster, typical mm -hmm. portmanteau. Sorry, the edutainment impulse of like because uh, it had that sort of elevated status. My only question mark with it, to your point though, is that. I think a lot of people have been spending a lot of time on it. I mean, they don't have any parameters. I feel like I've been on two hour conversations on it. Um, it's because we've had the time. <laughs> and I, I just feel like post pandemic, they're just gonna, 
maybe see a drop off in engagement and you might see versions of it become more exclusive and paid for um, uh, based, you know, building on what Victoria is saying. I think there might be in, like more, more exclusive and higher quality uh, like an added qualitative layer above that that you would pay to join mm -hmm. and be part of like in the same way that you might pay for a VIP access at South by Southwest or something. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, I mean, from like what I've seen of it, um, I get the sense that it's very much still in that kind of like business to business. It feels to me more like a business to business platform a little bit. Like, I think when you look at some of the beauty stuff that's on there, it's like founders talking about how to raise venture capital, how to grow your brand, how to scale your business. So I think like at the moment, it's more kind of like of a community for founders and people like really interested in the business of beauty versus like a consumer um, facing platform. And I think like, as Lucy says, I mean, here, the big, the big thing here has been like, well, the pubs are open now. So why do, why do you want to go and sit on Clubhouse? Um, but I certainly think that I do like, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I certainly think the idea of like, audio is really really interesting mm, yeah. um i think like if you kind of like isolate the hype this notion of like audio as the next like space that brands should be investing in i think that's um there's something in that yeah 100 percent. okay um another thing that there's been a lot of hype over are nfts um and we've seen some uh, some movement in fashion uh, also ar around that area. Um, do you think that could be relevant for beauty? Could you perhaps explain also, Lucy, maybe just uh, what an F NFT is and um, what your view on 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 the on NFTs are and um, if they're relevant for the industry at all? So a non fungible token. It's a digital file that is. Um, on, based on a sort of a blockchain and exists and it can, uh, there can only be one of them and they can be traded. Is that a fair enough explanation? I'm sure Victoria's that's, better at it. That's what I've understood me. anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it could be really interesting because I think beauty has actually been quite early to, or at least beauty creators. Um, I, I mentioned Innes Alpha, but you have Lucy Hardcastle. Um, have been quite early to, and, and with all these collaborations on virtual products, on, on games and stuff, I think fashion and beauty have already been quick to recognize the idea, uh, or relatively, of uh, something that exists virtually and having a value, and this idea of branded filters. So I don't think it's much of a, um, a leap to, um, to, to this. Um, I mean, Victoria, you and I were sort of talking yeah. about how um, it could be really interesting if you're thinking about creatives and beauty. Yeah, I think it says a lot about where, you know, I think when you, again, like when you isolate the hype, what the NFT trend is telling us is that like, you know, I, again, like I kind of think about what's happening in the music industry. Like you've got a platform like Spotify that controls the revenue that artists can create. So all of these musicians now looking to try and kind of try to, um, you know, they're building their own communities and they don't necessarily um, feel that they need to like rely on these big platforms anymore. They can actually like almost like deal directly with the consumer by kind of like minting and creating their own digital currencies. Um, and again, like authenticating um, the music that they're making. So then when I think about like, what does that mean for the beauty industry? You think like, well, you know, all these big platforms like Instagram and YouTube, they are the middleman between the consumer and the creator. So then, yeah, I think it's really interesting when you start to think like, okay, so if I'm a makeup artist, like I don't need that YouTube platform to be making my videos anymore. I can just go like directly, um, directly to the fans um, and like, yeah, create these unique videos, create an NFT. Um, and then it's, there's like a different kind of way for them to start to think about like new revenue streams. Um, and yeah, Lucy, you had that really great example about Pat McGrath. 
yeah, like if she was filming, you know, so much with beauty creators is like, you know, it gets ripped off or it gets, you know, whatever, like you could, she could in, in theory sort of monetize the a video of her creating a look backstage at Marc Jacobs at an iconic show. But I think one of the other things that I think is interesting about this is also this move by brands and people generally to try and move away from these big platforms as the gatekeepers, you know, so um, the fact that, um, Bottega Veneta has left Instagram, for example, and Gucci is now trying to sort of essentially become its own. So I keep on waving my hand in the screen. <laughs> um, uh, I talk with my hands, um, but have been trying to make themselves into sort of standalone media brands and content brands and establish more direct links with their audience. To me, the two things are linked in the sense that people are trying to sort of wrestle back control a bit from all of these um, intermediaries um, being the only way to reach audiences. That was one of my questions actually, because um, obviously these big tech companies have so much power uh, and it's just, it's growing, you know, as more people, more people spend more time online. Um, do you think that can work? I mean, you, you give the example there of Gucci, can, can they really, uh, lessen their dependence on these big tech companies? Is it possible? And um, what are the risks if they can't? Yeah, I guess it depends on the quality of and the integrity of what they're making, right? Um, because you're trying to become a destination. Like, will we tune into Gucci TV every day? It's different if it's sort of just appearing in your feed and you just sort of blithely accept it or don't or choose not to reject it. <laughs> um, so I think if they're trying to do this, they need to really think about what they're creating. And because, especially because there are so many stimulus, um, stimulants and pe things keep competing for people's attention. Um, so in, same in like the podcast arena, it's not like just about a brand creating a podcast, like you're not gonna have someone sit with you and absorb you for an hour if it's not interesting content. So they really do need to think of themselves if they're doing this as entertainers and media, brand, like, you know, proper editorial publishers almost. Yes, um, Victoria, what's your view on that, on big tech and, and brands? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting for me is like, just this idea of like, you know, when Lucy describes um, Bottega Veneta like choosing to come off Instagram, like it then makes me think about the fact that actually you have all these fan accounts on there anyway, and they're kind of self-sustaining and like building their own communities about around the brand anyway. Um, and, you know, like if you look at someone like Peloton, you know, they have their own accounts, but then they also have all these like Reddit forums, they have um, like Facebook groups. Um, and it's kind of like, they almost have all these like subcultures now that are like existing underneath the brand that like they can't necessarily um, like control. Like you have consumers now talking to each other about your brand. Um, so yeah, when I start to think about like the fact that I think in the past, like consumers have like, sorry, brands have gone onto these platforms with the idea, like we're just gonna like drop loads of content and people are gonna consume it. Like, I just think those days are kind of over and it's much more now about like being part of that community and being part of that conversation and really understanding like who your consumer is and which platforms um like they're on and what they're doing on those platforms because yeah like I recently was working with a brand that's founded by like it has like the face of an influencer um and they started a Facebook group with the whole idea to like give everyone in that community group access to this influencer and actually once they started the community group everyone was like we don't care about this influencer we just want to talk to each other so yeah, I think there's something really interesting there about like, you know, the idea that as brands, we often try to control everything, but like, we can't really always do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting when you think about like, for many brands, it's like, it has become like paying influencers or prohibitive Instagram media buys, right? And yet at the same time, we have TikTok and Snapchat actively trying to share revenue with their biggest creators 
So I wonder if the brands were able to improve substantially, if they, if it would end, end up in a, a sort of a long term as as more more collaborative with these platforms, but like less of a like transactional nature than it has been till now. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the next wave of the next wave of tech for me is like the platforms that actually like empower these creators yeah. to um, like generate their own revenue, um, to like create their own merch, to like own their audiences. Um, and yeah, like you're already starting to see, you know, like there's a new bank in the US that's actually like set up specifically for creators and it comes with like a debit card. And um, so I think, yeah, this whole like ecosystem of, of how these creators like monetize um, and grow their audiences. That's like, yeah, really exciting. Okay. Um, I just want to move on now and talk a little bit about commerce. Uh, Lucy, you mentioned earlier on in the conversation about um, how e-commerce was kind of looking all the same and there's a lot more that can be done in terms of making a, you know, a real sort of uh, inviting interactive virtual store. If you could expand a little bit on that in terms of um, where beauty could go with that in making you know, e-commerce um, more exciting, their online sites uh, a little bit more different, uh, more original and uh, more engaging. Yeah, there's two there's two speeds to this, on, and on one on one level, I don't know if Victoria agree. I feel like Amazon just wins all replenishable beauty, like even more so now, like owns that, um, and will become potentially like far fetches. The plug-in for luxury will be the plug-in for most um, beauty in um, logistics. So then you go towards the more experiential side of it, and I do think gaming will become more important. But then also messaging and trying to make basically trying to make, um, I, I like this term experiential e-commerce because I think that's like what a lot of brands are trying to innovate to do to make um, almost their e-commerce site replicate the sort of magic and experimental nature of, of a physical environment or a sort of branded experience. So, so gaming is, is one aspect and then, and then as, as I said, sort of more uh, options to interact or even personalize how you interact with a store and so on, or whether it's changing, you know, we saw concept stores think of themselves as magazines and completely reimagine their environment and work with digital creators. So I'd like to see more of, more of that. And then in terms of the physical store, I do think we're gonna have a hangover from the pandemic for a long time in the sense that it's gonna be a lot about hygiene, I guess. Like, so you're gonna have like a lot more emphasis, I think on um, voice operation for example, and like anything, everything being sort of completely touch free, even though it might be experiential. So brands will need to sort of think about how, if you are in such a tactile industry, like makeup, how to bring those kind of sensory experiences to life when you essentially don't want to touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I, I think is, is kind of interesting. And then also just in and it depends, I don't know which brands are doing this particularly well, but when you look at what the fastest growing area of e-commerce is, which is live shoppable video, and it's already on steroids in China, and you're seeing new platforms or newer platforms like shop shops here, um, and newness um, combining sort of video content with shopping, I think that's gonna become more prevalent, but it's it'll be interesting to see what retailer or brand really sort of own, owns that it feels like here in in the US specifically that's fairly latent still yeah okay yeah, Victoria you would agree with that yeah and I think like just to give some examples of what Lucy has talked about that I think is quite interesting is you know when you take that live stream trend and you then think about like well what does that mean for the physical store it's then like the physical store starts to become the backdrop for these sellers um, so if you look at brands like Depop, who are opening physical stores so that the sellers on their platform can go in and like shoot their merch and it becomes, again, like a community hub. I think Gucci are turning some of their stores into spaces where like staff can do um, live streaming and it's like the store then kind of becomes the backdrop um, for these digital environments. And then I think yeah, I mean, the the kind of like fulfillment stuff, I just think is is super interesting. I think like five years ago, every brand was talking about the flagship store. 
Um, and what's really interesting, I was reading last week on Vogue Business, um, a feature around like the Mango Fulfillment Center. And I just thought that was such a kind of like, um, yeah, like symbol really of like, you know, we used to really like worship at these big like branded flagships. And now every brand is thinking about like, how do we get the product to the consumer quicker? And how can we do that in the physical environment? Um, so I think, yeah, it's really interesting that it's, you know, that kind of like divergence of like more convenience, but also more experience and how you bring that into the space. Yeah, absolutely. potentially more localism. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, so we we had this sort of huge Chanel, huge Louis Vuitton, like there was a headline, it became like a big sort of um, a barrier to entry, like, and a store was the PR strategy. Whereas I think we'll, we might actually see that decentralize again into more local hubs that feel more like you have more of an emotional connection to somehow. Yeah. Um, and they're a bit more different. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually been one of the issues this week about, uh, you know, stores as fulfillment centers, just because uh, the role of the store is changing, obviously, with with online. And also there, you know, a lot of retailers are having to rethink their retail footprint as well uh, in terms of, you know, how many stores they have where, and where they are and how they can use that to maybe um, boost the online business. So it's, a, it's definitely a, been a discussion point um, this week. Yeah. Um, I just want to go on and ask you a little bit about data also, because um, obviously that's key. I mean, it's 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 driving everything at the moment. Um, there are also concerns over privacy as well. Um, and there is this talk about, you know, having a value exchange when it comes to data. And we talked there a little bit about it's kind of related in terms of consumers paying uh, for to be on social networks, that kind of thing. Do you think that brands need to really highlight the value they're giving so that the consumers will give them their data in exchange? Um, uh, do you think that that will need to be done because consumers will become a lot more reluctant to, to give up their data? I mean, you should take that one. <laughs> I feel like there's historically it's a bit like sustainability until recently there's been a gap between sentiment and like reality uh, or behavior right like because the convenience level is so like even now when I get asked to like accept cookies I'm like yes <laughs> I'll accept the cookies I, I think we're sort of slowly moving towards a reality and an acceptance that we actually don't have control of our data, especially as we're move, navigating cities that have got sensors and, and visual recognition everywhere. Um, and so I don't know that it's even possible for a brand to guarantee that they're not going to share your information about it. I mean, I think the only incentive thus far has been like personalization and anticipatory recommendations. So fine but I, I i just think in today's landscape it's actually impossible for a brand to like guarantee that anyway so uh just be as transparent as possible um and and that's all you can really do i hope i don't sound really fatalistic no, <laughs> but i think i mean it's interesting right if you look at apple and like the way that they're now trying to sort of like compete on privacy and like they're almost driving privacy as a kind of like luxury like it becomes part of the proposition of this like premium um phone that you're buying but i think like i guess for me where i kind of think it gets interesting like i 100 percent agree with lucy that it's one of those things where we all think we really care about it when it comes down to it like we just want to get the thing as fast as um we possibly can yeah but i think there's something interesting around like the data well-being side of things that like actually the kind of like emotional strain of sometimes like managing your personal data um, can feel kind of quite stressful. Um, so yeah, there's something interesting around like how that could become like the next like space for self-care. Although I think that's quite a future prediction. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm just going to go to a few questions in the audience uh, there. Uh, the first one is, do you think content creators are displacing influencers because they are seen as more authentic? And if so, what do you feel is the key to conveying authenticity versus just selling? 
Who wants to go first, Lucy? It's, well, it's an I'm sure Victoria will have interesting stuff to say on this as well. I think it's just the emphasis on it being less transactional and less high, sort of hyper commercialized. And even if it is commercial with these new content creators, I think the emphasis on creating something of value or unexpected or beautiful or funny, um, there's there has to be some substance to it. And I think that's the, for me, the distinction, like when you look at um, influencers, it just has become so obviously transactional. So apart from like, it's essentially being a media buy, like there's, that's, that's the distinction to me. Yeah, agreed. Like it's the hashtag ad, isn't it? Like people are yeah. just so over like these feeds of girls that just, all look this, like all look like Kim Kardashian and I think that's what I love about TikTok it's like it is this quite joyful space and there's like you know all these subcultures that are coming up from there and all these trends like you know you have the cottage core and then you had the um I mean I'm not a Gen Z so I don't necessarily know what all these trends are but you're like wow it's really interesting just the like visual language that starts to come through um, on these platforms that I think most brands, you know, to, to think about authentically being in those spaces um, would, from most brands, probably be like being a dad at a disco. So to me, there's almost like a Twitter component to it as well, because like, oh, well, certainly I follow, I follow Twitter curators now and therefore I discover new things that I wouldn't have ever seen but it's like you know when you pick people to follow on Twitter and then you get they share their interesting articles with you a similar thing has started happening with TikTok like there's a an, a, an influencer slash author slash personality called Aminato So over here and every week she puts on like a curated almost like a tv show of like her like 30 different favorite um, TikToks and they're, they're, she's got um, people, TikTokers in Nigeria, TikTokers in India, TikTokers from like LA and like it, it's an engine for discovery. So it's, it's kind of being sliced and diced in lo lots of ways with this idea of curation, I think as well, like curators as creators almost. Yeah. And I think like, I always use this example, but the K-pop brand that has this like crazy fan base that in a way like your fan base then becomes like your marketing campaign like there's a k-pop yeah. band that like their fans are so obsessed with them that when they launch new singles the fans will actually go and like take out billboards to advertise the songs and i just look like i think that speaks to the the authenticity comes from not just like broadcasting but actually like you know, being, creating, um, you know, I even just think about something like memes and the way that like now some of these, um, yeah, like artists, you know, go viral and it's because like all of their fans are like creating and making memes for them. So I think this notion that you can't just like, as an influencer, you can't just like be broadcasting. You have to be kind of part of the conversation with, with your fan base. Okay. Um, there's another question that has come in. Uh, what is your view on connected beauty devices? Is it a category that will become more mainstream? Victoria? Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the beauty devices thing, I think, again, can, can sometimes kind of like be a bit overhyped. It's like, you know, if we look at things like Oreo, um, like they recently shut down, right? And so... I, th I think like it is a really interesting space, but for me, I think like the power probably like is the phone as the diagnostic device in the future. Like the phone is gonna just keep evolving to be more sophisticated and like the camera will be able to like do a lot of that work for you. Um, so, I, and you know, at the Apple Watch has obviously like now started outselling um like the what the all of the watches that are sold i think in switzerland so i think it's more about it's less about like a separate beauty device and maybe more about like how these other devices might start to become diagnostic tools that then um give give you advice for products i think is where i would probably be looking more to what about you yeah i i completely agree i mean when i look at what some 
major with the, the major beauty players who have invested in these devices i i i feel like in a lot of instances it tends to lean more towards a pr tool um or a talent tool right to sort of look like you're an innovative company and attract innovative but like will a lot of these devices reach critical mass and be used to blend our own makeup at home i i kind of don't think so I mean, the only, the, yeah, yeah, I think the most interesting area where that happens is more in the health and well-being space where you can, you have all these very sophisticated diagnostic tests and that includes visual recognition, which to Victoria's point can be in a phone, where you can like understand your hormone levels and how that might be affecting, I think the area of hair nutrition and nutrition and um menopause and all of that kind of stuff is really interesting right now and so if you had like bordering on medical tests um and devices that could be one interesting area but it, it means more towards health i just i think a lot of this stuff has been it's a bit like some of the first forays into gaming is quite superficial right yeah um we just have one more question i'm gonna ask you because i'm, I'm aware of the time um uh is there any digital or tech uh trends or tools that you think will radically change how beauty products will look in the future? I think the barriers to entry to, I think it's like where brands come from is kind of an interesting idea. And Victoria and I, you, you, we were talking about this, like pretty much the only, like you already get consumers thinking of themselves as brands and Gen Z in particular thinking of themselves to some extent as a brand because they've grown up with this sort of outward social media presence and there's ever more tools to make that present very easily feel branded. So even when you look at Squarespace acquiring Unfold, which is a super amazing tool to make your imagery online look very professional, um, Facebook, among other startups, um, allowing you to create your own immersive events and ticket them and monetize that. And, and then platforms like Substack and Patreon, of course. Um, I think the next layer of that is like consumerizing the process of creating your own brand. Um, so at the very, at the very base level, being able to create your own merch, which is sort of, but like, will will that experience become consumerized in a certain way? I thought it's really interesting today. Um, the sex toy brand, and I forget the name of it at CES. Uh, Laura De Carlo's um, sex toy brand has started um, uh, offering up micro investments on Republic, uh, which is a bit like Kickstarter, where you can invest as little as a hundred dollars in in this company. So sort of all the levers of like how brands come to be are becoming, I think, more and more decentralized. And we're going to see more and more of like people creating their own sort of unique, unique brands. Yeah, I agree. And then I think, I guess just that more kind of like sensorial kind of like, for me, I'm quite interested in like what's happening in, yeah, this more like, how do we start to bring these kind of like more sensorial, like emotional experiences through these technologies. Um, like I saw the other day, um, like a new yoga mat that has, um, that will give you like feedback as you're doing yoga um, and like tell you which posture to kind of like move into. So I do think there's something interesting around like, yeah, how these technologies start to just create that quite sort of like immersive experience um, for people using, I guess, like these kind of like quite interesting material innovations. Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you both very much. It was uh, really interesting to hear from you and to hear your views on tomorrow's digital trends. Uh, so we will take a short break now and we will be back at 4.30 CET for a session on how to sell through live streaming. Mm -hmm.